Okay, well, we also know this isn't the end of the story. And in fact, that spring, Elsie married Saul Grossberg. Here's Elsie, whoops, sorry, with her, uh, her parents. Um, and in fact, I wanted to just mention, that this, is, this is your mother there, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Steve's grandmother, who we called Gussie, passed away when Steve was writing this long Baroque article, Theory of Human Memory, that Dan talked about early this morning. And he has a manuscript, which you'll see later today, manuscript page where he penned in to the memory of my grandmother um, on the front page of that very article. Okay, and Saul and Elsie were married for more than 50 years. And they had a third son, Ken. And in fact, Elsie devoted herself to education to help support the family. She became a New York City public school teacher until she retired. She worked in the public schools for more than 20 years and didn't limit her education to her pupils. All three of her sons have PhDs. And here's little Steve in the middle here. And uh, so, and Ken was then the third son. Okay, so, um, what's next, I don't remember. Okay, so then I wanted to introduce you to Elsie, who this picture was taken a few years ago. She happens to be wearing the very same dress. And I wanted to say, <laughs> like to say anything or do you want to just say hi to you? You don't want to say anything. No. Okay. So she says hi to everybody and we're very happy that she's still here with us and we hope for many more celebrations. Now, um, as you can imagine, Steve's childhood was somewhat turbulent. Uh, he's often talked about, to me anyway, about how the early loss of his first father affected his uh, psychology, and it was a difficult time for everybody at that time. And uh, like everybody then, if we're very lucky, we have very good childhood friends. So this is the cutout of Steve at age eight from that previous picture. And we have here with us today one of Steve's childhood friends from approximately this, this time. His name is Dick Samuel. This, and he's showed up for important events. This actually is a picture from four years ago when we were helping to celebrate Elsie's 85th birthday. And this is with his son, Matt. And I want to, before, and Dick's going to say a few words, but before he does, I want to tell you a little about who he is. He has had a, a varied and exciting and interesting life himself. You wouldn't be surprised to learn. And uh, he's a patent lawyer. And if you want to read about Dick's exciting career in part, it's actually in a book here called Laser. Um, Dick was approached, Dick and his colleagues were approached by Gordon Gould in 1976 um, with a purported patent about an invention that he had claimed to introduce uh, earlier. And here's a, here's a um, caption and a picture of Dick from the book. Uh, it says, patent attorney Richard I. Samuel and his partners spearheaded the long series of litigations. Um, and this is another quote from the book. Samuel, 36 bearded and intense, still bearded, I assume still intense, but no longer 36. I didn't have high hopes for the meeting. Samuel opened the notebook. He could feel the gold watching him. The handwritten heading at the top of the first page read some rough calculations on the feasibility of a laser, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And in fact, in the book, there's a facsimile of that notebook page where you can clearly see the word laser, which Gould had introduced and which is described in this long patent fight. Of the patent had originally been filed some years earlier but, and when, when Dick was first telling this story to us a number of years ago, I know he described how he and his partners virtually bankrupted themselves in the process, but they eventually won, and the patent was awarded many years after it was initially brought to their attention. But um, that's a whole other story, and Dick is here as one of Steve's childhood, and you can see lifelong friends 
And we're very happy that he's going to be talking to us for a few minutes. I'm really glad uh, that Gail asked me to come here, and I'm doubly happy to see uh, Steve's mother, who I've known for a very long time. Um, I first met Steve 57 years ago when we were eight years old. Uh, we were in the same Hebrew school class, that's where we met. And uh, we were in the Boy Scouts together, went on camping trips, slept in the same tent, and went to summer camps together. Now, growing up with Steve was a humbling experience uh, because when, no matter how smart you were and no matter how talented you were, Steve was smarter and Steve was more talented. <laughs> but, and that never became an issue. That was just a fact. Okay? <laughs> One of the nice things about Steve was that in spite of how smart and talented he was, he was a normal, relatively normal person. <laughs> I don't want to go too far. <laughs> now, we did many things together, and a lot of them were fun, but most of them don't make good stories. So there are two events that I remember very distinctly, and I'm going to wonder if Steve does too. Uh, the first one was he came over to, we were playing together in my house, and um, Steve sat down to play the piano. Now, I had just finished a year of learning that I couldn't play the violin, and two years learning I couldn't play the piano. And Steve came to the house, sat down at the piano, and played Rhapsody in Blue. Professionally, it was just absolutely beautiful. And my mother, who was in the, in the next room, first of all, couldn't believe I was doing it. She <laughs> saw Steve sitting at the piano and said, Steve, I didn't know you were taking piano lessons. And Steve said, I don't. <laughs> so my mother said, well, how do you learn to do that? And he said, I heard it on the radio. <laughs> the, the second time that I remember very well was December of 1957. Uh, I was a freshman at Rensselaer, and Steve was a freshman at Dartmouth. And I was at his house this time. And the first thing I remember was he told me that he'd been thinking about what he wanted to do for a career. And he told me he was going to write equations to describe the human brain. This was 1957. So uh, he got an early start. And the second thing which uh, stuck in my mind is I was going to an engineering school, and actually one of the freshman courses was calculus. So Steve said to me, can I borrow your calculus book over Christmas vacation? I want to learn calculus, but I don't, don't want to waste college credits for that. <laughs> you remember that, Steve? <laughs> anyway, I want to wish Steve many more productive years and I'm really pleased to have had the opportunity to come here. Did you lend him Thank you. All right. So, what could possibly follow a childhood lifelong friend? And um, we're going to switch gears drastically here when you see the answer to this question. But this, this uh, creature, I should say, has been alluded to already in, the, in today. In fact, it's the answer to question number seven of, of Robert Ajemian's quiz this morning. Uh, Francis. <laughs> Francis, the talking mule, if you look back at the question. And in fact, as one of a few birthday friends you're going to see today, we have a complete four-volume set of Francis movies. Now, where does Francis come into our story? Well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> 